Hi, I'm Ben Graham. Welcome to International Political Economy. Uh, and this is our lecture on barriers to trade. So at this point in the course, we've covered supply and demand, and we've been talking quite a bit about comparative advantage and, and how trade creates wealth. But we've also started to talk about how free trade uh, creates both winners and losers, right? And when countries want to limit free trade, right? When they want to restrict or shape uh, markets, right? How do they go about doing that? So this is our lecture on barriers to trade. We're gonna start with sort of this uh, with the idea of free trade and complete globalization and sort of where this comes from. And then we're going to sort of talk about how countries use policy to, to dial that back from sort of the raw free market. Okay, so we're really talking about kind of the law of one price and sort of what would happen in a completely kind of magically frictionless global economy. And then how governments use policy to step away from that with different uh, types of barriers to trade, tariffs, quotas, subsidies. Okay, here we go. So globalization, it's the free-ish movement of goods and services and other stuff between countries. Sometimes people talk about the free movement of ideas. We will talk about the movement of people across borders, but as, as we'll discuss a lot in the migration section, people do not move across borders nearly as freely as goods, services, capital, uh, um, ideas, things like that. Okay, so globalization is this free movement of things across borders, the end of the nation state, which is, I think, a little uh, 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 premature. Um, and, you know, so we want to start with looking a little bit of where did this come from over the last 70 years? So, you know, we'll talk in a, in a coming lecture about a little bit of a broader historical sweep, but let's just sort of go post-World War II here. Um, and a couple of things that were happening in the post-World War II era is that the costs of shipping and communication were falling rapidly throughout this last 70 years, right? So we already had sort of moved from sail uh, to, to, uh, to steam and, and to ever more efficient uh, 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 sort of internal combustion engines instead of diesel engine driven uh, ships, right? Um, so we moved even away from sort of like coal powered ships and now into like diesel powered ships. Um, and getting and, and cargo ships getting ever larger and, and more efficient, you know, the Panama Canal uh, getting deeper and the Suez Canal, uh, you know, all the, you know, everything's becoming more efficient in global shipping. Okay. Um, it's also, you know, it's a lot easier to communicate in terms of like, you know, if you look at the price of like an international telephone call and that just kind of like falling off a cliff, right? Um, the rise of the internet, obviously, um, these sorts of things has made it very easy to exchange goods and services and ideas across borders, right? Um, some of the technologies that underpin uh, modern globalization are seemingly simple. And I, and I want to highlight containerization um, as something that is very important in its own right, but is also kind of the example of a fairly pedestrian technology in some respects that has been completely uh, uh, transformative in the global economy. Um, so containerization is this idea that you have standard size metal boxes that you load goods in and you load them up at the factory gate and then you pick them up and you stick them on the back of a truck and they go to a train station and you pick them up and you stick them on a flat car and they go to a port and you pick them up and you stick them on a ship and they go to another port and you pick them up and you stick them on another train. They go there and you stick them up, you put them on another truck, they go there and nothing ever comes in or out of that metal box. It never gets opened up. No human beings touch it. Super efficient, just pick it up with these big gantry cranes and forklifts and stuff and you move them around. Um, compared to loading and unloading bulk cargo, which takes forever to do, stuff breaks, stuff gets stolen. Uh, you know, but it is just so labor intensive and every time you're changing mode of transportation, it just takes forever. Um, you know, so, so this basic idea of these nice standard size boxes that just move around uh, on and off different forms of transit has been completely revolutionary in terms of lowering the cost of shipping such that as long as uh, it's not something you need to fly by air, as long as it can go slowly by a cargo ship, I mean, shipping is pl practically free, right? I mean, we're shipping... Uh, for a long time, we were shipping uh, U.S. recycling. You know, you may have noticed U.S. recycling doesn't work so well right now because China has stopped taking in uh, plastic from the United States, by and large, for recyclable plastic. We, we were shipping recyclables 
thousands of miles across the ocean to be processed, right? Like shipping itself was just so cheap. You could ship trash essentially to be processed, right? Like, I mean, so, so you know, the cost of shipping a t-shirt from one side of the earth to the other is a few cents, you know, if they're, if they're packed this way and shipped this way. So this is part of what's driven globalization, right? It's just gotten cheap to move things around in terms of the logistics of doing everything. Um, but it's also the case that there used to be in place a lot more tariffs, a lot more policy barriers to trade than we see now. A tariff is just a tax on goods uh, moving across a border, right? And, and those tariffs used to be a lot higher. And we're going to talk quite a bit about the general agreement on tariffs and trade. We'll talk about the World Trade Organization that sort of grew out of it. Uh, but, you know, important idea here is just that tariffs have, have been falling throughout this past 70 years. Um, and looking forward, another thing sort of driving um, sort of real kind of the last, really the last 20, 30 years of globalization is kind of the rise of formerly poor countries as major consumers in the global economy. So you don't just get um, kind of trade back and forth between rich countries or between poor and rich countries, but a lot of formerly poor countries, you, know, you get a lot of what we call sort of south-south uh, trade, right? Um, so, so globalization is getting a lot richer in terms of the, the structure of the network. Okay. So what globalization has wrought, right? Um, so if you've got this world in which it's become very cheap to move things across borders, and we've removed a lot of the policy barriers that used to make that harder, uh, you get to a world where for a lot of products, uh, you're in this world where you have pretty close to a global price for that product. Uh, so oil is a really good example here. You can go check the global price of oil, or you can go check the global price of a bushel of wheat. Right, and which means you can sort of you can buy a bushel of wheat for almost the same price uh, in New York or in London or in Tokyo or in Shanghai, right, or in South Africa, wherever you are, right. There's sort of this one price for the bushel of wheat because shipping wheat, which can move slowly and store for quite a long time, it's so cheap to move. There's not a lot of tariffs on it, and so uh, it has pretty much you know if we imagine so law of one price says if it's a totally efficient market if there's no tariffs of any kind and if shipping were purely free not just cheap but entirely free then all identical goods must have the same price right that's the law of one price and what enforces the law of one price is uh, the ability of traders to engage in what's called arbitrage and arbitrage is buy low sell high right it's buying something in one place at a low price and then immediately selling it somewhere else at a higher price, right? And that's what's going to happen in the modern era, right? If, if there's a high price of oil uh, in New York and a lower price uh, down in Brazil, right? The people are going to buy oil in Brazil, ship it up to New York and sell it there at the higher price, right? So people exploit that. And when they're doing that, in the course of engaging in arbitrage, you force those prices together. Uh, not because you like have some abstract interest in enforcing the law of one price, but just because it happens. And here's how it happens. So you've got that cheap oil down in Brazil and expensive oil in New York. So you're going to go down, a trader's going to go down and buy a bunch of oil in Brazil. Well, guess what? That act of buying oil, that is increasing demand. That is a new demander coming into the market. So demand's going up, so the price in Brazil is rising. And then that trader is taking that oil and shipping it up to New York and selling it in New York. So that's an additional seller entering the market in New York. So that's that supply in New York is increasing that supply curve shifting out, which is lowering the price in New York. And traders are going to do this, engage in this type of arbitrage until the price of oil in, in New York, uh, between New York and Brazil is the same, or actually slightly different. The cost of shipping is going to be the difference, right? Um, so that's how the law of one price uh, gets enforced. Is if a price difference opens up, and that price difference is greater than the cost of shipping, somebody's gonna buy here and sell there until those prices equalize, right? Because there's money to be made. You know, it's not, it's not traders doing this to uh, enforce, you know, because they love the law of one price. They're doing it to make money, right? Buy low, sell high, make cash. Okay. But if you are a government and you want to sort of throw some sand in the wheels here, which you may want to do for a variety of pretty good reasons, protecting uh, folks who are going to lose out from free trade, industries that uh, may not quite be globally competitive, but you don't want them to go away altogether, uh, then you may need to step in and protect them. Um, so how do you do that? And we're going to look at three main tools. There are a few other types of miscellaneous regulations that you can use, uh, right? So governments can get creative uh, with wide varieties of what we'll call non-tariff barriers. 
But tariffs, quotas, and subsidies are really the big tools of trade protection. And even among these, tariffs kind of have pride of place. They're the simplest, uh, most common tool of trade protection. But all these three things, tariffs, quotas, subsidies, and even these other uh, regulations, they're all substitutes for one another. They all help producers, uh, specifically um, kind of owners of scarce factors of production who are going to lose out due to free trade. Uh, and they tend to harm consumers, right? Consumers want to buy the cheapest possible goods, and these barriers to trade are going to prevent them from being able to do that. Um, okay, so let's start with tariffs. Tariffs are the simplest, they're the most common. So these are taxes on imports, right? Um, sometimes you'll get tariffs on exports, but that's really pretty rare. By and large, it, so a tariff is a tax on goods or services moving across the border, and it's pretty much always taxes on imports. Plus, governments generally want to, uh, uh, yeah, they want to they want to make it harder to uh, to export things into their country. And what the goal here is the goal of a tariff. So a it collects some revenue, so that's nice. It's a tax. This is why it's so common as a tool. So it collects some cash for the government, while at the same time. It's creating a world in which the domestic price is higher than the world price. Because you've got the producer who's, okay, I can sell this at, you know, let's say Germany doesn't have any tariffs uh, on my wheat. So I can go sell my wheat in Germany at the world price. Uh, but if I go to try to sell my wheat into the US, if I go try to ship it in the US, they're gonna charge me, you know, 10 bucks a bushel to, send, to bring it into the US. Now my, my wheat is gonna cost 10 bucks a bushel more in the US than it does in Germany because I have to cover the cost of this tax, right? So you're gonna have a domestic price in the US that's higher than the world price and the difference is gonna be uh, the price of that tariff. So, you know, again, what this is good for is this is really good for, you know, if it's a tariff on wheat, it's really good for US wheat producers, right? They get to sell their wheat in the US market. They don't have to pay the tariff and they get to sell their wheat at that higher price, right? But it's bad for US consumers. Anybody who eats bread or anything made with flour, right? Uh, is going to be paying a higher price for that um, than they would have if, if, they allow, if the US government allowed the, the wheat to come in tariff free. Okay. Uh, the next sort of quarter key tool here we'll talk about is a quota, which is like a, just a quantitative, like a count them up limit on how much wheat or how many cars or how many uh, Italian suits can be imported into the country, right? Um, this is again going to generate a situation where the domestic price is higher than the world price, right? If you say, okay, well, you can import. Uh, wheat to the US, but you can only import a thousand bushels a year or something like that. Well, okay, so that'll increase the supply a little bit in the US, but it's, again, we're going to have that domestic price uh, higher than the world price um, if, if we've got the, uh, the quota in place. The difference here between a quota and a tariff is that the government doesn't collect any revenue. It's sort of the big, that's the key difference here. Um, and then we've got subsidies. So if in tariffs the government's taking in revenue, and quotas, it's revenue neutral. Subsidies are where the government's paying out money, right? And so subsidies are a way to artificially raise the prices paid to producers. In the US case, generally what we're subsidizing is the production of agricultural products. So wheat, corn, soybeans, sugar, uh, those are so the big crops that we intervene in, the big four, oh, and cotton, sorry, the big five. Um, in the United States, um, the dairy industry gets, uh, you know, the US messes around in the dairy industry a fair amount too. Um, okay. When you have a subsidy, right, uh, you, what you're doing is you are paying extra to domestic producers for every unit that they produce, right? So this is another way, if you have a, an industry that's not globally competitive and was going to be wiped out by foreign competition, you could put in a tariff to block that foreign competition, you could put in a quota to block that foreign competition, or you could, you don't block the foreign competition, you just subsidize your producers to allow them to compete, right? So you pay a little bit extra so that they can make money. Um, while selling at the, at the world price. So they sell at the world price, which isn't quite enough for them to break even, but then you give them a little bit extra on top and now they can stay afloat. That's the idea of subsidy. Um, your consumers are still getting to consume at the world price, so your consumers are fine, uh, but somebody has to pay for the subsidy, that's your taxpayers. Um, okay. So, if we look at some of those other, you sort of mentioned that it's not just tariffs, quotas, subsidies. There's a few other things that kind of other types of regulations that will get used uh, to restrict trade. You'll see domestic content requirements sometimes. So let's say, you know, if you're going to sell uh, an automobile in the U.S., at least 40% of the parts need to be made in the United States as well. Uh, or, um, you know, you might also see, so sometimes, and we'll talk about this quite a bit, we'll talk about how labor and environmental regulations can sometimes serve as backdoor protectionism. 
right? So when you put in place, let's say you say, in order to sell a, a you know, in order to sell tuna in the United States, it has to be caught in with dolphin free uh, nets, you know, with, with things that, uh, you know, and, and it has to be dolphin safe tuna. We have to, we have to catch it in a way that doesn't kill any dolphins. And so uh, one direct effect of that is it's going to protect the dolphins. Okay, so there's like the, the stated intention of the, of the law. But it might also be that US tuna fishermen have the technology in place already to do the dolphin free catching. Uh, and some foreign tuna uh, fishermen don't have that technology in place. And so by putting in this rule that only the dolphin free tuna can be sold in the US, we're actually, we're using that as a way to exclude some of those foreign, uh, those foreign fishermen in this case, right? So foreign producers can be excluded by some of these environmental regulations. So it can be kind of backdoor protectionism. Um, obviously there's the stated environmental goal and that does get achieved, but then sometimes there's an ulterior motive here, right? Uh, so so you can see that with, with labor regulations as well. Sort of if we say, okay, yeah, you can import that tariff free to the United States, but only if your workers are making at least $10 an hour or at least $5 an hour or something like that, uh, which is blocking some of the lowest cost producers uh, from overseas uh, from importing. So those labor regulations are A, they're serving to make sure labor overseas is treated better, right? So it has this, the stated, the stated intention does work. Uh, and actually with environmental regulations, we'll see that these type of environmental regulations on imported goods actually do push environmental uh, protection uh, beyond borders really quite effectively. Um, so they're good at their stated uh, goal, but they also can have this uh, backdoor protection uh, uh, role as well that we shouldn't ignore when we're looking at like, how do you build a, co uh, how do you build a co political coalition to pass uh, uh, legislation like this? Well, you've got to pay attention to all the different beneficiaries, right? Or if you're looking to block it, you have to pay attention to all the different beneficiaries. You'll also see national security regulations that come into play. We'll say, okay, well, we're gonna protect this industry because it's vital, it's a vital national security interest. Um, or we're not gonna let Huawei invest in 5G technology, Huawei being a, a Chinese telecommunications firm, uh, because we're worried that that's going to allow the Chinese uh, government to have a backdoor way to spy on US communications if we, if we do that. Um, or communications in our allies, which is why we're press pressuring our allies also to block Huawei from their 5G technology. Uh, we don't mind American, the Ameri you know, we don't mind the CIA being able to spy on uh, communications in other countries, but we don't want uh, other countries to be able to spy on communications in the US. Okay, um, so you'll see a lot of national security related uh, stuff as well. It's kind of showing up in trade protection around the margins. Okay, so those are kind of, those are the different tools, but now let's walk through in a little bit more detail uh, how tariff subsidies and quotas work. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna split that out into a separate video because I think this one's gone on long enough. And so we'll sort of do the nuts and bolts with the graphs for tariffs, quotas, and subsidies kind of as its own standalone video. So I will uh, record that shortly.